I V M. Is China really a country of one people, one language, and one party? Does China have a strong, efficient, and meritocratic government? Do the Chinese move with unity to reach audacious goals they set out for themselves? We are busting eight myths about China and the Chinese government in a two-part series on the Pragati Podcast. Takshashila's in-house China expert Manoj Keval Ramani joins us to bust these myths. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics, and international relations. We are your hosts, Hamsini Hariharan and Pavan Shrinath. Many of us in India are quite familiar with American politics, society, and pop culture. This also applies to a certain extent to Europe, Australia, and Canada. But India's northern neighbor, China, remains a mystery to most of us. We know a little about the Sino-Indian War of 1962. We know a little about what's happening in Doklam, and all of us consume goods that are made in China. But there are still a lot of gross misconceptions we have about China, the Chinese, and the Chinese government. Helping us bust these myths over two episodes is Manoj Kaval Ramani. Manoj is an associate fellow for China studies at the Takshashila Institution. Previously, Manoj worked as a journalist in China and in India for eleven years. He even worked with CGTN, the China Global Television Network, an English media house owned by the Chinese government. Manoj also has a weekly newsletter called Eye on China that comes out every Friday in Pragati. Eye on China tracks various developments in China from an Indian perspective. If you're interested in China and not subscribing to his newsletter, you're really missing out. We'll be back with Manoj to discuss myths about China after this short break. Hey everybody! It's another great week on IVM Podcast. Please make sure you're following us on social media. If you're not, we're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also, please do make sure that you give us a rating or a review for whatever show you enjoy. It's really helpful when we get those kinds of ratings. And also, please make sure that you spread the word about podcasting. That's something that I think is really, really important to the ecosystem. Right? The more that you let people know that you're enjoying podcasts and what kind of podcasts you're enjoying, the more likely we are to get more and more people on board. This week on Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by Adman and author Ambi Parmesan. Ambi talks about what he learned from the prominent people he has met, and also how things will change in the advertising world in the light of the Me Too movement. On Crock Tales, listen to two standalone stories by Anand based on the concept of love, lust, and relationships. On the Pragati Podcast, Pawan and Hamsi talk to the co-founder and editor in chief of the News Minute, Danya Rajendran, about online journalism and building a digital news platform. On the kinetic living, Urmi spoke to Nikki Gupta, the owner of the Italian bistro Mia Cucina. Nikki shares her experience of training for the Mount Everest base camp and how it changed her perception towards fitness. This week, Anugrah Shivastav from Small Case talks to Anupam about all weather investing and why it's important to investors. And with that, let's continue on with the shows. Hi, Manoj. Welcome back to the Prakriti Podcast. Hi, Pavan. Thanks for having me. Manoj, you're the rare China expert in India who's actually spent a lot of time in China. Right? Good to know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean. Could you tell us a little bit about in what all capacities you spent time in China before we dive on and move on with the rest of the episode? I'm um, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I first visited uh, the mainland China, the Chinese mainland, in 2001, 2002 as a tourist. Uh, my father has been working in that part from that part of the world since the 70s and the 80s. So. Um, I got an opportunity to visit in early 2000s. Uh, I was impressed as a tourist. Uh, I primarily went there to shop. Um, my next visit was in 2005, uh, which is when I took again a tourist visit across parts of China, some parts of South China, um, and some of the prominent cities: Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou. Um, and again, this was when China was preparing for the Beijing Olympics. In a couple of years, you had a counter running, so you had lots of development happening. Um, but I was there primarily as a tourist. I was somebody who just begun his career in journalism, um, and this was an opportunity to just get out. Um, but my more sort of serious stay in the country started from 2011 onwards. Um, so from 2011 to 2016, I lived in China for a period of five years, a little over five years. Um, two of those years, I was doing freelance work and I was doing manufacturing work, contract manufacturing in parts of China. And wow. Yeah, I mean that's again an extension of uh, family's work in China, um, and this is when I'd taken a break from journalism, and I was sort of soul searching and finding my way through life. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I spent two years doing contract manufacturing. Um, after which I realized I was not good at that at all. 
um, and I decided to go back to journalism. Um, and at which case, I well, there was an opportunity at uh, China's largest sort of state media outlet, uh, not largest, but the central uh, television broadcaster. This C- is CGTN. CGTN, uh, which back then was CCTV before it became CGTN. Um, and so this was an opportunity. They were looking to set up something in terms of their digital newsroom and the digital presence. Um, and yeah, and that was the opportunity. So I spent three years with them. Um, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Did you also manage a pub in China at some point? So yes, um, this is, uh, I haven't personally managed a pub, but my uh, father does have an investment with a Chinese partner uh, uh, in a nightclub uh, uh, in Ningbo. And that's, uh, I've n- never been to the place, unfortunately. Um, and I don't think my father's been there for a while. Uh, and like some of these things happen, these were sort of experimental investments that he's made. But yeah, I was fascinated even when I found out about it. So, you know, in Bangalore, especially, if not in elsewhere in India, we know a lot about Indians working in the US, Indians starting a company in the US and having a subsidiary in India and a lot of this happening. It's fascinating to know that this happens between India and China as well. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here at Takshashila uh, doing research in China, uh, having actually lived there and uh, understood a lot of what's happening in the country. No, thank you. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. It's been fun. Manoj, let's bust some myths about China, the Chinese and the Chinese government. Over two episodes, we'll explore eight myths and not just bust them, but use them as anchors to learn more about China from you. Some of these myths about China are commonly held in many parts of the world, and some might be uniquely Indian in our limited understanding of China. We understand a lot more about what's happening in North America or Europe than what's happening in China. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, And a lot of that has to do with just uh, historically um, the lack of engagement between uh, these two cultures over the last hundred odd years. Uh, a lot of it has to do with colonial India's colonial history, uh, comfort with language that connects us to Europe and America, American television in India. Um, and English being a link language. Absolutely. And those sorts of things are... Uh, and also, I think for a lot of Indians, uh, the West, and it's, I think it's very similar for the Chinese, the West is aspirational. Um, and neither country for the other is really aspirational. Um, to some degree, that sort of is changing within India with regard to China, because we're looking at them as um, just the phenomenal growth that they've achieved over the last 40 years. Um, so there is a certain envy plus aspiration in terms of how at times we approach China because of that. Um, but predominantly, if you were to ask young students in India uh, who are planning to study abroad, where are they planning to go? You wouldn't find too many of them saying China. That's changing, but not too many. Um, They'd be going to the US, to the UK, to Europe, to Australia. Um, So, yeah. And there are some Chinese businesses which have taken a special interest in India, right? Yes. Especially in our cell phone market. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, in terms of uh, technology, uh, sort of these new tech investments uh, that are coming in. So um, you've got the Alibaba Group, which is invested. You've got DD Kwaidi, which is invested. Um, you've got a number of Chinese startups which are looking at the Indian tech sector, uh, the Indian service sector. Um, those are the two sort of predominant things. They're not really and telecom, right? Yeah, you have Xiaomi, OnePlus, and many of them which have like a hardware uh, production unit in China. They do their software development here in Bangalore. Yep. So there's a lot happening that we have not yet woken up to entirely. No, absolutely. And I think some of the hardware is also gradually moving here. Um, and that's also happening. And part of it might be a product of the trade. Part of it also might be a case of rising wages, better opportunities in India in that sense. Um, so yeah, so there, there is a change that's happening. They're looking at markets outside China to start manufacturing. Um, and India is ripe with its talent, with opportunity, with a ready market that's available that you can service. So, yeah. All right. Let's dive in then. Perfect. Uh, so I will list out nine myths one by one and you'll tell us whether the this myth is actually true. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's uh, false or there is something a lot more complicated happening. Okay. All right. Myth number one. China is a country of one people, one language and one party. Hmm. Um, actually, I wouldn't necessarily... So that's a loaded question. So it's one people, one party, and one... What was the third one? One language. One language. Okay. So I'd say no. Uh, But there are sort of shades in that. And uh, so let's just start with the business of one people. Now, part of this one people is a uh, 
political construct, the idea of nationalism, and you know, as one, uh, so there's constructing that national identity. I'm just going to take you back to about say a hundred odd years ago, which is when uh, the last of the dynasties fall. Um, the Qing dynasty falls. And this is a nation at that point of time that uh, devolves into warlordism, uh, different sort of groups holding power, forces working as opposed to a central government which is in uh, play. This is the sort of puppet government after the British so entered is, and opium war, all so that yeah, this happening. Is all of, so the opium war and all of that is over. Uh, this is in 1912, when, 1911, 1912, when the Qing dynasty falls finally and you have this republican experiment uh, which gets subverted. And that that's followed by this period. So that that decade is sort of this decade of warlordism, complete chaos. Um, the First World War is going on. The First World War ends, and there is a hope that with the end of the First World War, um, China is going to become a player with far more equitable rights. Uh, these colonies that European powers and had sort of occupied uh, within those pockets of concessions that the European powers enjoyed would be would go away. Um, but that doesn't happen. Um, the German concessions are given to the Japanese and that sparks more anger. And internally, China is sort of people are debating, the intellectual class is sort of debating, um, well, what should China be doing? What should the future of this land be? And you can see in that that there is this churn of ideas as to who are we? Um, and so you're talking about democracy, you're talking about science. So one of the slogans of this May the 4th movement in 1919, which is a lot about this churn, is, uh, oh, China must turn towards Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science. But there's no real conception of what democracy means. Um, and that's when you have in 1921, the Communist Party set up. Uh, side by side, you have Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang. And the next two decades, this country goes through a civil war, invasions, and there's a lot of chaos um, with different people competing in that idea space. So would you call that one people? Not necessarily. You would call that multiple different ideas which are competing um, to emerge as the successor idea. And eventually that civil war ends and you have the Communist Party emerging. Um, and the Communist Party, once it takes power, it recognizes that Okay, ethnically, China is a reasonably diverse country. Um, why I would say reasonably diverse is because in terms of the number of minorities, um, over the next few decades, the Communist Party institutes commissions that recognizes certain minority groups. And by the end of the 70s and 80s, you have about 55 ethnic minority groups that are recognized. And these 55 ethnic minority groups enjoy certain special privileges in certain ways. Um, but those special privileges are also sort of contingent on... Um, that the primary, uh, the bottom line has to be the sustenance of the Communist Party system. Within that, there are certain privileges that you might enjoy. Those could be language privileges, uh, protection of your language, protection of your cultural rights, protection of school opportunities and all those sorts of things. Those get subverted in the name of uh, the sustenance of the system. But there is a recognition that this is what exists. So it's not entirely about China being the Han people, uh, the Han identity, which so, is sort of constructed almost, right, as yes, the pan-Chinese yes, identity. I mean, if you look at Chinese history over a couple of thousand years now, over the last 2000 years, you will see a lot of contest for this space. Um, all these dynasties that are essentially fighting and falling and even the intra-dynasty conflicts that are happening um, are all largely amongst Han people. Um, so there is a lot of conflict as to what do you mean by one people. If you mean ethnically, then today China is... Fairly, it is homogenous in the sense that about 91.5% of the people in the country would be identified as Han Chinese. There's about an 8.5% minority. But that's about 112, 115 million people at the minimum. Right. And uh, so that's a large number of people. Um, but, but as far as, say, India is concerned, <laughs> there is pretty much nothing that would be one label that applies to 90% of Indians, yes. right? Yes. Even religion does not apply to that number. Yes. So so in that sense, they are a little more homogenous than They're Indians. a little more homogenous, but then if you were to cut that ethnicity down, uh, you can sort of slice this bit about one people in many ways. So if you slice it down regionally, so there are issues of which region do you come from? Uh, there are, and each region will have its own dialect uh, of essentially Mandarin. Uh, but if if you go to South China, particularly say Hong Kong and parts of Guangdong, uh, 
Cantonese is far more prevalent and they are very distinct languages, Mandarin and Cantonese. They just happen to have the same script. The script is similar in many parts of the world in that sense. But uh, the language, the the words, the numbers, the system are distinctly different. So it's so, like Italian and English, you still yes, have the Roman humor, uh, exactly, Roman script. Exactly. But, so it's distinctly different. And a lot of the times while I was there and particularly while I was doing contract manufacturing, if I had staff from... It's the south of China from, say, Fujian province. And if we went to Gansu uh, and sort of spoke to people around there, they would have difficulty having these conversations uh, in sort of explaining technical terms about, well, this is what we want to sell at. This is what the cloth is. This is what the material is. So these sorts of things came up. Uh, and a lot of the times, particularly on phone conversations, when you're sourcing materials, um, you realize that uh, a lot of my Chinese colleagues and staff would tell me that uh, I don't understand what the supplier is telling me. And I used to be like, well, why? You're Chinese. You have the same language why could you not understand this um, and that's when sort of I started recognizing that okay there are distinct differences um, and people would not recognize that and that's similar to like say if you look at it in India um, the Hindi spoken in Haryana to the Hindi spoken in Bihar or Orissa will be there will be nuances there will be differences the Hindi spoken in Rajasthan will have differences um, and obviously Hindi is not spoken all across the country um, but still you would have those differences uh, in dialect but in terms of languages, I spoke about the 55 ethnic minorities. And there are hundreds of languages in China. Um, a lot of them are dying. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the utility of languages. Uh, and uh, and the state sort of imposing one language. Essentially, so the state, technically the state does allow education in a second language. But then what is the utility of it if all my transaction is in Mandarin? Right. Um, so if I'm going to go to the bank and the form is in Mandarin, what's the point of knowing my Korean language. Uh, in Korean, at least Korean, you will have a certain use in some senses. But the more sort of obscure uh, languages, you're not really going to have a use for them. Um, so therefore, it sort of dies out in natural death. So part of it is market dynamics also, uh, but market dynamics structured by the state in some way. Um, so therefore, I'd say in some ways, yes, you could say one language, uh, but that's not entirely true. In some ways, you could say one people as a construct of national identity, which the Communist Party has tried to create. Um, and as the best example for that is after nearly two and a half, three decades of attempting to rely on Marxism, Maoism, communism in the late 80s, 90s, the Communist Party essentially dumps all that and goes back to ideas of century of humiliation, outsiders coming in and taking away our glory and we were a glorious nation and all of that. And that's constructing a national identity, a Chinese identity. Um, and there is a certain amount of that happens elsewhere, right? In absolutely. India, you have the idea of Bharat Mata, which came about at some point. Yeah. And so yeah, no, absolutely. Um, my only re the only reason why I would bring that up in this context is the idea of one people was not so organic and has had to have been constructed despite there being such a large homogeneity, such a massive homogeneity in terms of ethnics, which is about 90 plus percent being Han. Right. So... One language, not quite. One people, not quite. But one party. So one party is interesting. Yes, technically, yes, one party. Actually, technically, uh, uh, there are eight other parties which are allowed to operate in China. Oh. Uh, but uh, they, there isn't a political competition. So the Communist Party is the vanguard party. It's this... Uh, it's under the, it, there is a Leninist structure in the sense that there is one party and that one party is deeply intermingled with the state um, and the party is recognized by the constitution as a leading player um, and therefore uh, effectively there is one party um, but the interesting thing about that one party is that uh, that one party somewhere seeks to subsume different interest groups. Um, so I spoke about how they went from the first few decades of relying on Marxism and Maoism and revolution. Um, that was the idea of, uh, sort of, that was Mao's fundamental notion of, you know, the, there needs to be constant revolution and churn. Um, and in the eighties, they sort of, after Mao dies in 76, they sort of look, they sort of shift, uh, Deng Xiaoping, they shift. And what happens as part of that is that you start to recognize that you need to change the nature of the party in some way. Um, you loosen control. Um, as you lose in control, you sort of face certain friction in terms of the students' movement, particularly, uh, which was the most, which was the strongest sort of movement in the late 80s. Um, but if I was to go a decade from that, from Tiananmen and come to about 98, 99, um, the party sort of recognizes that we need to 
change our membership structure. We need to invite newer social groups within our fold. Um, and therefore, you have Jiang Zemin coming up with this idea of the three represents, which is his theory, which essentially says that the party needs to represent broader struck social groups. Um, and therefore, things like private entrepreneurs and these all sort of find space within the party. So the one party bit is true in the sense that it is one party. But this one party has sought to adapt and subsume different interest groups, which play out within sort of intra-party inter factionalism, um, which so we hear a lot the, about. So it may not be an exact parallel, but in India, we have multiple political parties and then interest groups outside the political parties here. The Communist Party subsume all factions, parties, interests and groups. Essentially, that's what it tries to do. And... I think this business of one people, one party is sort of dangerous as even a myth um, because what that does is that it, it sort of equates the party with China and Chinese people. And I think it's important for people outside China to realize that you don't want to be drawing that equivalence. It's dangerous because that's where you start creating this notion of, oh, Students are agents of the party. If this Chinese student has a view which uh, might be critical of uh, a certain view in the West or which might be critical of an opinion that Taiwan, if, you know, if, even if a Chinese student who has a view that Taiwan is essentially a part of China and it's a renegade province, while I might not agree with it and while it's a professor at a university level, at a university level, you might not agree with it. It's fine for him to express that view because that might be his view. It is not fine for him to coerce the university to change it, but neither should you be looking at that individual as an agent of the Chinese state or as a party indoctrinated agent. As an agent in that sense, he could, you know, because there there is a distinction between individuals and the party and that needs to be maintained. Thanks, Manoj. We'll be back with Manoj to discuss myths about China after this short break. Who said healthy food is boring? Who said raw veggies is just salads? Who said eating fats makes you fat? Look forward to my recommendations on healthy food and exercise hacks on the Kinetic Living Podcast with me, Coach Urmi, every Wednesday on the IBM app, website and anywhere you get your podcast from. Welcome back to the Prakati Podcast. Myth number two. China has a communist government. You talked about Leninism, you talked about elements of the structure, but does China really have a communist government? Um, actually, that depends on how would you define communism. So if you were going to look at communism as uh, a single party state, which sort of controls the commanding heights of the economy, if you're going to look at communism from that sort of point of view, Again, not necessarily. Uh, so Xi Jinping talks, uh, and if you're also going to look at communism from the point of view of class. So if I'm, I'm just going to take these three parameters, you know, the structure of the party, control of the economy, and focus on class divisions and class warfare. Um, and sort of flattening society and creating a new social yeah. order yeah. where you don't have uh, historical discrimination, class structures, the uh, the proletariat ruled by someone else, all of that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's so those are my sort of three parameters if I'm going to take a look at whether the government is communist. So yes, there is a Leninist party state structure. So the communist party is the only effective party. Uh, it is uh, deeply intermingled with the state. Uh, it's sort of uh, the party essentially cannibalizes the state uh, and there is this friction between the party and the state apparatus or often uh, for control uh, and that sort of changes at different points of time given leadership given situations and today I, we're at a stage under Xi Jinping where the party is significantly and sort of rapidly cannibalizing the state um, under Xi Jinping um, so in that sense yes um, but in the sense of control over the commanding heights of the economy, um, so a lot of Chinese development today, uh, so this fantastic economic growth that we've seen, a lot of it is driven by people outside the apparatus. The state has played a role for innovation. It has played a role. It is invested, of course. Money has sort of come from state support, uh, policies that support some of this growth. Um, but the state is also aware that it can't innovate. 
it can't sort of you can't command innovation it sort of keeps falling back into this idea of commanding innovation but there is also an awareness that you need the private sector you need a thriving private sector and guys like uh, jack ma from tencent ponima these guys have come up not necessarily only because the state it's also despite the state and today these guys are major players so what the state does is that it eventually starts to find a uh, an arrangement with some of these people with some of these enterprises and sort of co-ops them in a manner of speaking uh, to its own agenda and these individuals and these companies also the private sector also sort of they are willing to be co-opted because that gives you opportunities so that's how it functions um most job creation in china today is done by the private sector you wouldn't categorize that as a communist system where the private sector is essentially creating your jobs um in terms of class which is my final sort of thing um you don't really hear chinese state officials the government you don't hear xi jinping you don't hear anybody talking about class warfare in china just uh, earlier this year xi jinping celebrated uh, there was this massive celebration of karl marx and in xi jinping gave a speech uh, at that celebration but he didn't mention class at all and which is fascinating that you're talking about marxism without a reference to class at all and that's where this whole idea of socialism with chinese characteristics comes into play so therefore i wouldn't necessarily say that there is a communist government in that sense i mean it's as capitalist as anybody else it's looking at you know growth development opportunities so sorts of things and china isn't a classless society by any measure by any measure of course not um uh, so you've got uh, different classes in terms of just uh, so if you look at it economically if you look at it socially uh, there are sort of different cultures and subcultures which if you were to sort of look at from a class point of view you kind so one of the groups that you would look at is migrant laborers um these are people who uh, usually come from poorer backgrounds they are living in they've migrated to cities they don't necessarily have legal residence status in cities but they are working over there and this is not a small number this is over 200 to 20 million people um so there's a large chunk of these people um and this is the underclass these are individuals who are denied opportunities uh, who are you know who, who, are, who are systematically denied by the state as well right yes. because uh, china has the hukou system Absolutely. where if you are a rural resident you are necessarily legally a rural resident you are not allowed to legally work in the city unless you Yes. Yes. Paper. Absolutely. Unless the your employer uh, essentially gets you the hukou, and that so it's like a visa to go work in a city, right? In some ways, yes. And it, uh, so you can still be working over there, and nobody is going to really pick you up. But what happens is that you're systemically de- denied uh, welfare. So that could be medical services. So you won't necessarily get access to state hospitals. You won't get access. Your children won't get access to educational opportunities in state schools and those sorts of things. You can go to expensive private schools, but um, you can't afford that obviously so that's where uh, the problem sort of comes into play um so there is obviously a deep class division um there is uh, there's a famous phrase that i learned while i was there which was uh, i think it was called to how uh, and that essentially was sort of a slightly pejorative term to refer to uh, the novo rich so uh, a lot of my friends who were sort of uh not necessarily wealthy in the traditional sense but people who'd sort of um who'd sort of had had a westernized education and who saw themselves as more cultured and, you know people that i met uh, who saw themselves as more cultured uh, and they would then look at say people in rural communities who suddenly hit you know riches um largely because of land um and you would see uh, them sort of flashy cars with this gold strip on the side and those things would get picked up by the media and the media would also sort of run this thing about oh and this to how farmer and sort of those sorts of things would come into play which is an explanation of uh, social stratification um and and, and very similar to india absolutely right? i mean I, I remember outskirts of every large city gurgaon bangalore mumbai elsewhere people have made money via land absolutely absolutely when i so when i sort of experienced this uh, this conversation uh, with my chinese colleagues my first reaction to them was like oh so this is your gurgaon and you know this is your just outskirts of noida where uh, this we is have gurgaon they have guanglong right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so it was something like that uh, so there is of course class so in that sense 
is the government communist is the system communist uh, well it, it's communism is what it is uh, with chinese characteristics within that i don't think that there is any adherence to the value of communism so the chinese characteristics matter more than the communism absolutely. or socialism absolutely it's like i think there was this joke going around a couple of years that socialism means india first <laughs> right i mean there there it it means nothing beyond a point right? <laughs> yes, it's a totem i think the chinese characteristics essentially means that um the party must sustain the party state system must sustain everything else is sort of secondary so that is your bottom line um and i think this business of communism and adherence to the values of socialism marxism communism and all of that um I think in the 80s is when this died which is when so when you have your paramount leader which was Deng Xiaoping at that time saying um I don't care if the cat is black or white until it catches the mice it's a repudiation of the ideology um it's about pragmatism um and that's how it's functioned uh until in the last few years under Xi Jinping where things have started to change um and he started to exert greater control um also it no longer it doesn't reflect anything close to communism but it reflects something closer to a sort of cult of personality which is being built uh, and a system is being used in that uh, if, with that purpose we'll explore that more in a upcoming myth myth number 3 the government owns everything in china you talked about this briefly already about how you no know, there are private players and so on but there's at least this perception that no matter who you are in china whether you are alibaba ali express you are something else the state sort of has a control over you and it's even if it's capitalism it's capitalism by the state hmm. how true is this actually how i'd see this is uh, the first thing about the state owning everything um i think fundamentally when you hear something like this you think about property rights um and you think about land so technically yes um land is state owned um but uh, there were sort of changes made in the 1990s and subsequently also uh, where leases were allowed which uh, fundamentally caused the uh, sort of laid the foundation of a massive jump in puppy individual wealth um because you created opportunities for people to lease the land you gave away a lot of state housing to individuals who could then sublet who could sell who could do all sorts of things so you created a private sort of market for land uh, so, and for property so just tell us a little more about that so technically any house any property in china belongs to the state no that's not how it is so it's uh, so it's like this uh, so let's assume that you have a high rise which has been constructed the land belongs to the state okay but the house will is your property um so okay. that's the idea that's the bifurcation so i and can actually the land is leased to a builder who can then go and construct a housing community and so and so forth so the builder does not own the land whereas but he can sell the property constructed on that lease uh, so i can own uh, an apartment in a high rise it's my personal property um so that's how that functions okay yeah and so so technically yes i would say that yes of course things are owned by the state but um no there is private property rights in that nature um there's also a case for uh, say in terms of businesses um yes i've already spoken about the fact that there is a lot of private sector investments a lot of the private sector in china is thriving um the state doesn't own everything in that sense but it's the state can the laws can are flexible enough uh the system is flexible enough for the state to get its will when it needs to and when it wants to in terms of uh how private sector sort of plays with the state and whether this is state capitalism um i don't necessarily see it as that way how i see it as so i see this public sector working together in the context of as a private player if i am a an important player i'm a big enough player and i see that uh i can align my interests with the interests of the state um it opens doors for me and the state's interest might not be in my interest so one of the best examples that i can give for this is things like you know big data ai those sorts of things um where the state has a certain interest in developing uh algorithms developing ai technologies and those sorts of things as a private player i know that i control a reasonable amount of data but the state has access to far greater data and there's going to be fewer restrictions on the state invading privacy and accessing that data 
and there's going to be little uh, comparatively there's going to be hardly any public outcry in that context but if i as a company was to sort of violate certain data norms and if people feel uncomfortable with me as a private company sort of accessing their data um, they can raise that as an issue and that can be used against me so there is that sense of uh, distinction so therefore for me if i want to develop an algorithm on better selling some of my products or better targeting some of my products uh, maybe it's better that i work with the state in some other capacity because it opens certain doors for me um so the linkages draw through that Okay. Um, it's not necessarily uh, the state saying thou shall work with us it's also the private industry saying this is a good place to expand my share my market share my scope my opportunities uh, and also somewhere evade some scrutiny because if i am a strategic partner of the government um, i get that much more leeway uh, as opposed to somebody or my competitor who might not be so the state basically intervenes in the market and sort of picks winners and losers a little better yes. and sort of gives them extra support yes um which again it's to me there are many shades of gray right even in india for example say you are a um, a payment bank or a wallet company hmm. then when india wanted to go down the path of demonetization and promoting cashless you benefited and there were people who worked more closely with the government yeah. but even there there was a hard limit on what kind of favors that you can get and even if you can get those favors those are not necessarily legal yeah whereas in china they are a little more legal yeah i mean the, are... the bit of legality is really tricky because uh, and i think uh, i'm sort of paraphrasing but dinny mcman in his book sort of says this and he says this very beautifully where he says that there are rules but the rules are so fluid and flexible um and they sort of change so easily based on needs of state um and i'm talking about not just the central government i'm talking about local governments at different different levels um the rules have in built this fluidity um and that allows you to intervene to distort uh and that also results in lots of other things like you know deep corruption crony capitalism all of that and the private sector leverages some of these opportunities as best as it can um but when a private enterprise gets caught up uh in say whether you are a p2p company Uh, and the state is fine with you lending and creating businesses because that's good for them um, but when you get caught up uh, don't necessarily expect to be bailed out as a company um, the aggrieved party might be supported might be bailed out because you don't want stability issues to come up but don't expect to be bailed out you will be allowed to fail um, and more and more companies today uh, do fail uh particularly in the last few months we've seen the entire p2p lending sector completely crash in china um and you haven't seen the government necessarily step in and bail companies out they try to support individuals where they can again because they are worried about stability issues uh and also issues of confidence within the state supporting them um but companies can you know the companies can fall and rise based on uh, how the market treats them so in a funny way you've had uh, the united states and other countries who have sort of bailed people out saying oh these are institutions too big to fail and we don't know yet how that will happen in china but there are instances i'm certain if those institutions are as big as what the americans bailed out in america beijing won't even let them get to the point where they are there is this conversation of too big to fail some things are too big to fail and beijing is fine with it that's the bargain that it's made that these things are too big to fail these are uh, so this would be your big banks this would be your big insurance players these guys are too big to fail um and that's that's that so there is no argument with regard to that forget the big banks even some of the smaller banking system is too big to fail okay so the Fair banking enough. system is very well supported when i talk about the p2p lending these are sort of private players who leverage the option of um the desire within the government to expand credit mm. uh, within the system and therefore to support some of these alternative means of credit um you do that by some of this has grown organically um and the government has started to play catch up to this uh, in terms of its policy initiatives and some of it has been well okay we we're trying to play catch up to it but we don't want to necessarily disrupt it with immediate tight sort of leashes around it let's just see where this goes so some of it is that some of it is actually genuinely trying to catch up with it and some of it is that 
schemes, fly by night schemes come up, companies come up, uh, people see easy opportunities to make money um, and they invest without thinking, which happens everywhere. Um, and so then China has its own version of chit funds. Absolutely, chit <laughs> funds, pyramid else. schemes. Pyramid schemes are among the most popular sort of uh, things which end up collapsing. And in fact, there's so many government statements and regulations saying, guys, be careful of pyramid schemes. Um, but people still invest because they seem enticing. Thanks, Manoj. We'll be back with Manoj to discuss myths about China after this short break. अगर आपकी जिंदगी में कोई ऐसी आपको दुविधा हो जिसका सवाल कोई दे नहीं पा रहा तो हमने बनाया है आपके लिए एक खास शो जिसका नाम है सुन लो जी सुर लो जी जिस पर मैं पवन कुमार आपका सूत्रधार आपका स्वागत करता हूँ ताकि आप पूछ सके सवाल सोनू से यस आई एम सोनू हेलो प्लीज टू मेक योर मीटिंग आई एम सुपर रियालिटी सेलिब्रिटी और दुनिया के कोई भी प्रॉब्लम नहीं है जो सेलिब्रिटी सॉल्व नहीं कर सकते तो मैं आपके सारे प्रॉब्लम्स का हलाइजेशन एंड सॉल्वाइजेशन कर दूंगा तो जी हाँ सोचिए मत जरूर सुनिए सुन लो जी सुन लो जी हर बुधवार डेट इज वेनेसडे प्लीज लाइक आए शेयर आए कमेटलाइज अगर आपके पास कोई भी प्रॉब्लम्स है सोनू को बताइए सोनू सारे प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व कर सकता है इसी तरह तो मैं सुपर सेलिब्रिटी बना हूँ Welcome back to the Prakriti podcast. Uh I'll come to myth number 4. China has a strong, efficient and meritocratic government that moves in unison to reach goals that they set out for themselves. We believe this, right? When I mean, we have this hodgepodge government with no capacity in India, but you know, China is a very strong, efficient government and you know, they have a bureaucracy which is meritocratic, they have a party structure which is meritocratic and the best people are put uh, to do various jobs. Actually, this is one of my favorite myths uh, because it's just so untrue. Let me just sort of try to begin to dissect this uh, the way we've put across this myth. Um, so I don't agree with the word strong. Um, it depends on how you define the word strong. There's also an issue with efficient, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. So if I was to replace strong and efficient with uh, powerful and effective. Um, i would sort of find myself a little bit more agreeable and i'll tell you why i say that um the meritocratic bit i don't agree with at all um, okay so we'll come to I, that last yeah and i don't think i can replace that with any other term um but uh, to me a strong system a strong governance system is one which accepts supervision which uh, has a capacity for self correction uh, without necessarily the system being appended or collapsing that's fundamentally how i would define it so they have self correcting loops yeah within it whether they be in terms of how in most sort of liberal democracies we have the system of checks and balances with the separation of powers um or whether they be internally there is a system of checks and balances uh, but there has to be some sort of an institutional mechanism which sustains so you have institutions you have checks and balances uh, and you have a self correction capacity um that's how i would broadly define a strong system um now the problem with the chinese communist party system is that while in the last 40 years we've seen phenomenal growth which has given rise to this perception of a strong efficient system this is the same system which produced mao zedong and the cultural revolution this is the exact same which was not an aberration which was a decade long event um this is the same system which today has uh, xi jinping taking charge and building a cult of personality uh, and a dangerous cult where he's essentially become the leader of everything um where criticism uh, is diminishing um and where the core objective of party cadre is to maintain political loyalty and political integrity and a lot of that is being enforced with the anti corruption campaign that he ran in the first 5 years um the anti corruption campaign is sort of twofold at one level it's sort of reorienting incentives of different officials and it's also tackling corruption uh, which had become endemic to the point that and it's not just Xi Jinping who thought of this i mean uh, Hu Jintao the uh, president before Xi Jinping the general secretary of the party before Xi Jinping while leaving uh, at the 18th party congress uh, which was 5 years ago 5 6 years ago when he sort of formally sort of handed over power to Xi Jinping at the party um he had spoken about how corruption had become such a massive issue that it could be a fatal issue for the party um so it was a matter of existence and it was a matter of survival um now that's a system which had devolved into such deep corruption the response to that was 
centralization, undermining of the institutional mechanism and the rise of one individual authority. Now that's... Are you talking about India? <laughs> well, in some ways, you can find parallels if you would want to, but I think that in India, there are still sort of institutional mechanisms where uh, there is a check. For example... And there is still quite a bit of corruption. There is still quite a bit of corruption. Uh, and uh, But uh, the best example from an Indian point of view would be, uh, you know, the Aadhaar judgment that we've seen a couple of weeks ago. Um, it strikes down a massive government initiative, which would never happen in China. Um, so a system that is unable to correct itself. Now, in some ways, un in the Communist Party state system, a lot of this sort of self-correction within the political system uh, or the governance system, so I'm keeping the media outside this, uh, a lot of this self-correction happened in the context of factions and competing interests, which sort of then came to compromises. But today, uh, you've sort of undermined that under Xi Jinping. That sort of fluid institutional mechanism of factionism is also undermined. Um, it's undermined through the anti-corruption campaign. Um, so therefore, I wouldn't necessarily call it a strong system. And the other sort of point of the strong business is uh, a state, a system that is afraid of public supervision, that is sort of that fears to a certain degree what sharing openness of information with people can't really be classified as strong. It's powerful, yes, because it but controls so many levers of power. It controls force. It controls uh, communication. It controls the media in some ways. So that, I think, that's how I would classify it. So you're saying it's powerful, but it's fragile in some ways. In some ways, yes. And I think uh, this uh, concentration of power in Xi Jinping at the moment um, is a product of that fragility, uh, is a response to that fragility um, and it actually further weakens the system because it, there are question marks about this surviving of what after Xi Jinping? Who takes charge next? Does somebody take charge next? Can somebody question him? So it's those sorts of questions which sort of remain and don't look at this from the horizon of today or maybe two years, 10 years from now. Does this system sustain? How does it sustain? So those are the kind of questions in which I would sort of that's the way how I would frame the debate on strong. Uh, in terms of efficient and a government that works in unison. So um, I think here it's important to sort of understand the incentive architecture uh, that allows the party state to function in unison. So at no point, I mean, I said this a couple of times already in our conversation that over the last 40 years, China has experienced phenomenal growth. It's experienced phenomenal development. Um, from 1978 to 2018, you've had about 800 million people who've escaped poverty. Um, that's no mean feat. I mean, it's unprecedented in that sort of span of time. Um, so clearly something has worked. Something has worked right. Um, and I think that sort of performance legitimacy can't necessarily be easily wished away by saying it was in spite of the government. I think the government had a role to play in it. Um, but the efficiency of the system in the context of how it moves and how it changes based on certain policies and how it changes its priorities, that's a tricky thing. For that, you need to sort of get a sense of the political economy of China. So, um, so if the central government has a, and this is how sort of loosely the political economy is structured, um, the central government usually identifies a vision and says that, oh, this is what we want to achieve. Um, and it sets up certain targets and says how we want to go about it fairly broadly. It sets up a national framework within which local governments, which are essentially party uh, governments, those guys I have the freedom to create their own policy framework of how they want to achieve some of these targets. And they have the freedom to set up their own targets. And often their targets might actually exceed the central government targets. Um, again, I've done a recent study on artificial intelligence in which, uh, just to give you an example, the central government's target for artificial intelligence in terms of the scale of industry by 2020 is 150 billion RMB for the core AI industry. If you look at the local government plans, and I've looked at about 18 local government plans uh, their uh, assessment is that by if I was to sort of cumulatively take all their targets for 2020, they are projecting the scale of industry to reach about 429, 430 billion RMB. So that's wow. nearly three times what the state central government is saying we think we should reach. The reality is the scale of industry is estimated at, at the highest today at about 30 billion RMB. Okay. So in the next two and a half, three years, they want to, uh, if the central government target has to be met, it has to grow by at least fivefold.
And if the local government target is met, it has to grow by at least about 13, 14 fold, which is just manic. It's not going to happen. But this incentive structure is that the central government frames a vision. The local government frames its own policies of how it wants to execute that vision, how it wants to frame its own vision within that context. And because the central government has said that this is going to be a priority, it's not just an economic priority, it's also a political priority. And that sort of channelizes funds, the banking system, policy, the policy architecture, the sort of state uh, policy architecture to sort of start framing opportunities for businesses in that area. Um, and local leadership also realizes that, okay, this is something that my bosses up in Beijing would like me to do. So let me invest in this. Let me also create funds which invest in this. Um, we saw this happening in things like steel, coal in the early 2000s. Um, and the result of that was that because you sort of wanted to please your bosses and you saw opportunities here. Um, so there's an economic opportunity, and there's a political opportunity. You ended up creating massive overcapacities. Um, and you didn't care in that process uh, that you're polluting the environment beyond repair in some ways. Uh, you're ruining your soil uh, which is polluted by minerals. You're ruining your water um, because you wanted to achieve certain capacities um, because that was your central target. So would you call that an efficient system which is not... Or even an effective one. I would call it effective in the sense that you're setting certain goals, you're meeting them. Yes, you're not necessarily concerned about the externalities. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened uh, in the last decade and a half is with, particularly if I was to look at steel, coal, energy, these sorts of things... Um, that there was a desire to expand capacity um, in some ways because China wanted to and it felt that it needed the steel capacity. Um, you expanded capacity to the point where you've, you now produce half the world's steel uh, and you have massive overcapacities. Uh, and therefore, you started then seeing, oh, we need to cut down. You created a debt problem for yourself because of that. Now you want to cut down those capacities because they are wasteful. Plus, you've created externalities uh, such as pollution, if I was to take one, and I'm not just talking about air pollution, water, soil, air, all of that included. These externalities hit a critical mass by the time Xi Jinping came to power. And therefore, you had Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang talk about a war on pollution. And that pollution remains one of his priorities going ahead till 2020. So, and now to reorient that system, which has gotten so used to this particular you know, the subsidies for steel and coal, to sort of cut capacities and to reorient that system saying... Okay, so now I'm not no longer going to assess you on GDP and on capacity on these specific things. I'm going to start assessing you on how you deal with pollution. You need to change that incentive architecture. Um, I'm going to assess you on innovation ability. Um, but how do you assess that? So those sorts of architectural changes are now taking place. So the efficiency and whether the system can move in unison, we will see. The fact that it's not easy for that to happen is evident in the anti-corruption campaign because a lot of the anti-corruption campaign is also getting guys in place who you think will follow your diktat. Um, there was a massive conversation last year uh, at the 19th Party Congress and thereafter in October to December last year where there was a suggestion that the Communist Party uh, in its assessment of bureaucrats, in assessment of party cadre, will drop GDP goals and GDP numbers as a target of assessment, as a measure of assessment. And that's one of the prime measures of assessment. There's no public record of how the party assesses, but based on what we can understand and based on what the priorities are in terms of what the party says, you get a sense that GDP figures are important. Um, but uh, now they want to drop it because they see that in, in the quest for that GDP figure, um, there are a lot of other problems that are being created. So you want to drop it, but you can't really drop it because then how do you assess these guys and what then drives them? Um, so I think there are sort of deep contradictions within this political economy. And um, what happens to the overall Chinese story if they're not sustaining 9%, 10%? Absolutely. So in the last five years, when Xi Jinping came to power, now six years, um, late 2012 is when he took power. When... He took power. One of the things that he sort of started saying in the early on in his tenure was, oh, economically, we've entered a new normal, uh, which was sort of uh, a very sort of polite way of saying, don't expect high growth. Things have changed. Um, part of it is fair. You know, the economy is upgraded to a different level. Your, you know, your growth structure is going to change. Uh, the other thing that he spoke about was something called supply side structural reform. 
which is a very dry way of actually saying we need to cut all these capacities and we need to fundamentally reorient how we are doing things. Um, in both of these things, so the new normal has persisted. The numbers have slowed down. Um, the supply side structural reform effort is about cutting capacities, which requires a reorienting of political economy. Um, and that's evident even today, because now after the 19th Party Congress, he set up something called the three tough battles till 2020. And one of those tough battles is pollution. So you and he talks about drawing new measures of assessing party cadre. Um but the prime measure in that, at least that we know of right now, we know that he couldn't remove GDP. Um, and that probably is because of practical reasons as opposed to ideological. Um, but the prime measure that he's added is political integrity and loyalty. That's your wow. fundamental measure for assessing the quality of party cadre. I don't think that's a system that's efficient. That's a system that is... Sycophantic. Exactly. It's not an efficient system. Um Again, time will tell. This is early days in terms of how he's setting this up. Um, and we'll have to see over the next few years how what happens. So my takeaway was when China has set a target for itself that is decided at the top, there is a way in which those targets trickle down to the lowest level and people further innovate on in that mm. in a way. And uh, those targets are have been met so far in the last uh, couple of decades, but at the cost of many other things going wrong. Yeah, so I would look at it from the point of view of targets of scale and capacity have been met. Uh, but the be it in construction, be it in absolutely. industry, be it absolutely. in anything. They've not just been met, they've been exceeded. Um, but targets related to quality and qualitative issues or externalities in that context, those are now the real issues. That's where That's how I'd put it. Also, in terms of some of these, so there's a lot of this expectation that, you know, when the Chinese government announces a target, it's going to meet. So like right now, when Xi Jinping says that by 2020, we will eliminate poverty, um, they're going to meet it. And I'm certain that they will meet it. Um, but I think a by lot some of measure, even their measure for poverty is a fairly good measure. Um, it's far higher than the international standards. So it's not a bad measure. Um, but how you go about doing this? And whether you do this, so a lot of this is politics as usual in any country. So no government, even in India, is ever going to say that we've announced a policy of making so many toilets and ending open defecation or something like that. Um, that they're going to come back to you five years and say, we didn't meet the target. They will say, we met the target, but. So there will also be a, we met the target numerically in some ways. Yes, but. Um, uh, there's no safeguards on people falling back into poverty. Healthcare costs are an issue. So have you addressed some of these structural things, some of these structural issues so that you prevent this sort of slipping back into poverty? Or have you met a target on paper? I think that's where the sort of uh, friction would lie in terms of efficiency. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, because there is there has been this focus on targets starting from output scale and so on, China also has fairly unreliable numbers on a lot of these things, right? Yeah. When people contest the Chinese GDP figures and other figures, because China is so big on the global scale, there have been people who track how high the shadow from the oil container is, right? To estimate the rate of oil use. There are all these satellite techniques used to give up alternative estimate for what China's growth is. So there is all, because targets are measured yep. and tracked, yep. they're also fudged. Absolutely. Um, And I think, uh, so this particular Chinese leadership, uh, Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping, particularly Li Keqiang, I think he's been fairly... Uh, honest about this. Uh, he's on the record to say, uh, you know, look at our numbers that are being reported as more guidance value than concrete <laughs> numbers. Uh, and I think he's been fairly honest about that. Um, uh, and I think there has been a lot of effort being taken to within the country, uh, to within the sort of government apparatus, the party state apparatus, to address some of this. Uh, they've not done it well, of course. And that's partly because for local governments, it's just easier. Uh, to fudge. And it's very difficult to find out uh, whether the numbers given by local governments are fair because um, governments are deep, local governments are deeply in linked to local industry with party officials being involved with companies and all of that. Um, 
and if the if an enterprise starts giving you false numbers and it's you know so your local numbers go false and so there's a lot of systemic sort of you know everybody's scratching each other's backs right till the and any time you ask for measurement and say i will give you an incentive based on this yeah. measurement that you will give me absolutely you are rather than say look i just want to measure there were no penalties for absolutely. you absolutely but we want to understand that's yeah. a very different that's setup. a very different setup. yeah right same here right when we want to say bpl card and you do below the poverty line suddenly everyone is bpl absolutely but if you objectively measure educational attainment or absolutely. something where there is no money tied to it absolutely no the, absolutely the yeah. system change no. all right so let's end with the last part of this meritocratic government mm-hmm. so you told us a lot about this but how does merit work in the system because for us we have within the bureaucracy you have a upsc you get through an entrance exam in a state or a national level and after that you're a career bureaucrat hmm. uh, in politics it's about whether you win whether you raise enough funds hmm. you do a lot of things but hmm. how does merit work in china to this i'm going to sort of go back a couple of hundred years perhaps um, so this business of meritocracy uh, sort of is uh, funnel down through actually not even couple of hundred years back i'm going to go back a couple of thousand years so it's funnel down through this confucian system uh, which got adopted in this imperial examination system now why i say confucian system uh, because uh, the idea of uh, sort of one of the tenets of confucianism is that uh, you uh, that there is a certain so while society is hierarchically ordered uh, there is a element of social mobility based on knowledge education intellect and those sorts of things quote and quote merit yeah quote and quote merit um how do you assess knowledge education intellect nobility and all of those things uh, is another matter altogether i mean today we might think of sort of technical skills and you know uh, stem education some of those things uh, today we might not think of somebody who's studying literature as noble and you know but rather somebody who's doing engineering who's doing medicine so it's subjective there is privilege i mean that yeah. we understand well absolutely. outside of china absolutely so one of the parts is, is one of the aspects is confucian social mobility the other aspect is the imperial exam which was this grand exam which was held across the country or across the empire when i say country it's also i'm constantly reminded of the fact that the geography of china today the borders of the modern state a uh, modern chinese state are very different from what the empire was over millennia it was much smaller it expanded and shrank at different points of time and a lot of what we see today as modern china is a construct of the late 171800s um and even thereafter given that tibet was absorbed much later right. um but yeah so that aside um this idea of the imperial exam which was held across the country where you had different levels of examinations uh, where people across the country could compete um and uh, as you cleared those examinations at different levels you eventually got into the bureaucracy and you got into the imperial court um and that was your pathway to mobility so people studied for years and years and years and got through these exams so this has a far longer history in china uh, right i mean the indian civil services exam or the joint entrance exam to get into the iit is a fairly modern invention yeah, absolutely in this, this i'm talking about like i said uh, at least over 1500 1600 years ago and this is when the sort of uh, system sets into place and it modifies changes what subjects are to be valued what not those sort of change over time and uh, that happens um, and a lot of the 1800s when the opium wars have happened and when china is sort of going through its uh, foreign invasions and occupation um the lot of the sort of uh, nationalists uh, or the folks who talked about things like well we need to become a powerful state talked about how the imperial exam is deeply problematic it doesn't prioritize certain things and we need to change the structure of the exam and that should be our reform process um and then, ironically a lot of these folks who were part of that group who were talking about these things and these are today folks a lot of these people are sort of well known in china as uh, a group called the self strengtheners who had sort of you know work to achieve who sort of identified that wealth and power was important a lot of them had actually failed the imperial exam at multiple times <laughs> um so so yeah so that is and today the modern version of that imperial exam is something called the gaokao uh which is what you take at university level uh, and you sort of you know get into university and then from there you enter uh, different streams of life civil services could be one of them um but yeah that's the essential structure so if you're looking at merit from that point of view that imperial examination system sort of persists uh, today in the format of the gaokao the gaokao is heavily criticized but also very respected 
um, within Chinese society in some way. Um, and it's a quirky examination in some ways. Um, so that's one part of social mobility and merit uh, in terms of a society. In terms of government, um, I wouldn't necessarily see it as merit in that sense because your progress in government relies not as much on institutional systems and achievement and those sorts of things, but it also relies on your networks. Um, it also relies on... So if the leadership today is looking at political integrity as the primary marker for, you know, your quality as in, as a bureaucrat or as a civil servant, that has nothing to do with your skills or your merit. Uh, you know, uh, I could be implementing so-called Xi Jinping thought with posters of Xi Jinping and speeches of Xi Jinping and setting and funding, subsidizing a university department in my locality, holding study sessions, uh, asking people to sort of assess security, make pledges, whatever. My growth levels could be substandard. My development levels could be, I could be deeply corrupt, but I could be deeply loyal. I will survive and I will grow. Um, if If political integrity is the primary thing, um, now, if you're looking at other markers, there have been studies which have looked at, say, when you look at GDP. So if this was a meritocratic system, which looked at GDP growth as an important factor, you would see people at the highest levels today would be people who at local government levels when they were working would have achieved the highest GDP growth rates. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. That correlation is very weak. Um, so... I don't necessarily therefore see it as a meritocratic system. Uh, I see it as a system that serves its own purposes um, and which has an architecture in which you can implement policies a little bit better when compared to, say, a system which is far more riddled with friction. So something like democratic societies where you have constant elections, where you have constant contestations. The contestations might be fewer and might be less public. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call that as meritocratic. I mean, if it can be subverted so easily within a span of a few years by a single individual and without any massive social fallout, I don't see that as a meritocratic system. I see that as a compromise of different groups. Thank you, Manoj, for coming on the Pragati podcast to talk about these various myths around China. As we discussed in the beginning, I think in India, we still don't understand China, the Chinese government and the Chinese people and society very well. So I think this is a great first step in talking about this. We've had episodes in the past with, with you and with others talking about various very specialized aspects about China. But I've often felt that we had a lack of basic understanding of uh, how China works. And all these other conversations happened at a higher level where we didn't get the premise of China sufficiently. So thank you so much in helping us uh, educate ourselves about how China is and how China works. No, thanks so much. It's uh, my pleasure. And uh, I think this is not an issue that's so that's unique to India. Um, uh, one of the sort of popular books this year is a book by the Fairbank Center in the US, which is titled The China Questions. And the essential purpose of the book is to look at very simple questions and have experts answering them in very simple, approachable uh, means so that it can reach out to a large number of people because a lot of people know very specialized stuff without really having thought about the more basic things about how society is. So, Manoj, we hope to have you back here uh, shortly to talk about a few more such myths and explore a few more things about uh, China's foreign policy, the Chinese media, you know, uh, China society and more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions for Manoj or for us, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati.com. In a later episode, we'll be discussing some more myths around China. For example, does China really have a grand strategy to take over the world? Do keep an eye and an ear out for this later episode. And don't forget to check out the weekly newsletter Eye on China by Manoj on www.thinkpragati.com. Thank you for staying with us till the end. Visit our website at thinkpragati.com for your daily dose of brain fodder on all things public policy. You can subscribe to the Pragati Podcast on the IVM Podcast app or wherever else you get your podcasts from. We're there everywhere. Everywhere.
it's IBM here, let's go. We the IBM kids on the block over here. Just to talk, taking a break from producing all day. Coming on this podcast because we got stuff to say. IBM Daily is the name of the show. Monday to Friday, we ready to go. Talking about stuff in our head. We might even talk about our favorite bread. Signing out. It's IVM here, the podcast network that's in your ear. Catch IVM Daily, Monday to Friday, on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai, instead of being left at the Tower of Silence after they die, are now cremated? And why? Because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s. Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal but three? One of them was seen but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Verma and in my weekly podcast The Seen and the Unseen I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action I speak to experts on economics political philosophy cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind but also yours The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday so do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in you can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer